Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ash Wednesday, where we began our journey to the cross and through the cross. I grew up in a tradition where Lent was something you found in your pocket. Um, and I was well into my uh, seminary experience before I ever heard of anything about what we're doing tonight. But once I saw it and learned how Christians have observed the liturgical calendar, especially in this time of year, uh, the more this began to mean to me. And Ash Wednesday will not just mean something to you on Ash Wednesday. It will also mean something to you on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. Because then you know a little bit more about what you're celebrating. Ash Wednesday begins the Lenten journey. This is our first step on this journey. And we do it because it's not just Jesus' death that saves us, nor is it just Jesus' resurrection. It's all that is Jesus saves us. His life, death, and resurrection. And the Lenten journey is an effort to get at all of that. Lent is 40 days if you don't count the Sundays. And therefore, it is roughly a tenth of your year. I've heard it explained that tithing is giving a tenth of your money and Lent is giving a tenth of your year to God. Maybe that is a way to look at it. It's a time for confession, which is not meant to dwell on our sins, but to rid ourselves of them. It's good news. It's about repentance, turning around and living our lives in such a way that they're oriented towards God. And it's a time to think about our own mortality. I want to pause here and say from the beginning something I think that needs to be said as the pastor of this church. I'm sure you heard about the plane wreck today at the airport. That was a CTEH plane. And all of our CTH, CTEH people are well. Uh, they were not on that flight. Um, but all of our CTEH, CTEH people lost friends today and need our prayer and love. So keep them in your prayers in the days to come. Um, Alan and Janet, Chrissy Milner, Aaron Mitchell, uh, all stand in need of our love and prayer. It is a reminder, though, that this is not a dress rehearsal for any of us. And to think about our own mortality is not meant to be morbid. It is meant to remind us that if we don't live on purpose... We will live purposeless lives. It's meant to remind us of our finitude that you and I do not have forever. So we better be about the things that matter. Or else we will live our lives about the things that don't matter. And it is a source of wisdom. Just reminding us that none of us have forever. And we don't get a second chance at this trip. So Lent and Ash Wednesday are meant to make us fully alive, even as we think about mortality. And I hope that is your experience tonight. Over the next few weeks, we hope to take you on this journey in several different ways. On Sunday mornings, we will be talking about the parables of Jesus. Stories that trick you if you're not careful. Trick you if you are careful. Most of the time with parables, I find myself identifying with the wrong character. Like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. Y'all, I am that older brother. But when the story ends, the father and the younger son are inside the house partying and it's the older brother who feels righteous, who's standing out in the fields and is not yet in the party. Would you go in that party if you were the older brother? Or the Good Samaritan. Remember, it's the clergy that walk by the guy in the ditch first. Yikes. We don't analyze parables. We participate in them. We find ourselves in them. And so over the next few Sunday mornings, we'll be thinking about the stories of Jesus and how we find ourselves in them. We also, beginning this Sunday, will have art on the altar table. Each week, an artist in this church will be depicting that parable in their own way in some 
artistic expression which will make its way to this altar table. And we couldn't be more excited about that. I've seen the first one. Uh, and if it comes up for sale at the auction, I will outbid you uh, at Meal and Deal. It's incredible. And one more thing tonight. Uh, we're talking about the parable of the sower tonight, and I'll tell you more about why later. On the way out, there was a basket in the table to my back left, two baskets, full of envelopes, and inside those envelopes are small packets of wildflower seeds. We want to invite you to take those packets home with you. There's information about what those wildflowers are and how you plant them, which is basically sow them. It's that complicated. And we want this to be a discipline for you over the next few weeks and watch those seeds grow. And think about the kingdom of God and how it is growing subtly in our midst today. So in all of these ways, we hope that you'll go the whole Lenten journey with us to the cross and through the cross. Welcome to Ash Wednesday. Bring the deepest part of you to the deepest part of God you can find. And let's worship God together tonight. You will need your worship guide and your hymnal tonight, so I invite you to turn in your hymnal to 323, and let's stand as we sing all four verses, Come Ye Sinners.
Will you join me for a prayer of confession? Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and we have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. We have lived for ourselves and not for others, judged where we should have forgiven, belittled where we should have built up. We have not done justice or walked humbly with you, Lord. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess to you our dishonesty in daily life and work, our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to declare the faith that is in us. Have mercy on us, O God. Forgive us for all uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Have mercy on us, O God. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. Have mercy on us, O God. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Amen. We're going to sing our way through Psalm 51 tonight, and you will see at the bottom of that inside page there are notes and measures and words for you to follow. You will join me on that refrain as Brittany and Mary sing us through um, the rest of the psalm. This is that psalm that says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away, but wash me clean of my sin. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Lord, hear our prayer.
reading from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20 from the New Revised Standard Version. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there, while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on a path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on a rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell onto good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, if you have ears to hear, then hear. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure it only for a while. Then, when in trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the age and the lure of wealth and the desire for things to come in, for other things, come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. These are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you have your pew Bible, you might want to turn to Mark 4 and keep it open tonight. My life is a listening. God's is a speaking. My salvation is to hear and respond. It's what Thomas Merton wrote, the famous Trappist monk. I am a listening. My life is a listening. God's is a speaking. The Word. My salvation is to hear and respond. A large crowd gathered around Jesus, so large, in fact, that Jesus had to get into the boat and sit down while that large crowd stood on the shore. And he told them this parable, which I wanted to start with in this series and consider with you on Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, because it is a parable about parables. Did you hear what Jesus asked his disciples in their inquisition. He says to them, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any of the parables? This seems to be an interpretive key story to all of the stories Jesus tells, which might be an indicator that we want to pay attention and get this right. If we don't understand this parable, how will we understand any of the parables? A farmer goes out to sow seed, and unlike any other farmer I've ever met, this farmer doesn't seem to care about where that seed is sown. This farmer doesn't care at all about good soil or bad soil. This farmer is sowing here, there, and everywhere. Some seed fell on a path, and before it had time to germinate, birds came and ate it up. Afterwards, the disciples asked him about this. By the way, 
quick aside, I think that's one of the reasons Jesus always taught in parables. The whole crowd hears the story, but the disciples stay and ask for a further teaching, an explanation. Huh? What did that mean? Maybe one of the things that separates the crowd from disciples is that the disciples linger. They participate. They want more Jesus. Jesus said this seed, this seed that fell on a path and the birds came and ate it up, this is like those who hear the word, but immediately Satan comes and takes the word away. We don't talk much about Satan anymore in our branch of the Baptist tree. Sometimes I think we've gotten too enlightened to talk about that without blushing a little bit. But surely we can all confess tonight, loud and clear and with no uncertainty, that there are powers and principalities at work in this world. Forces of darkness and evil that are beyond us, that with all their might try to prevent a hearing in our ears of a word from God. Maybe they try to prevent it because it's bad for business. Maybe they try to prevent it because it would cause some discomfort. Maybe they try to prevent it for reasons of the market and the invisible hand. Maybe they try to prevent it for political agendas. Or maybe the family name. I don't know. I just know that all of us are susceptible. All of us are susceptible to the propaganda and the spin of the powers that be. I've been pastoring for a little over 20 years now, which isn't all that long, but I have noticed a change. When I first started pastoring, when the clear teaching of the church and the scripture and the way of Jesus collided with someone's political ideology when I first started pastoring, they would rethink and reevaluate their political ideology. Today, when the clear teaching of the scriptures and the church and the way of Jesus collides with someone's political ideology, they most often change their church. Y'all, whoever has control of our ears has control of our lives. We don't have ear lids. Which means whatever we're hearing, we're ingesting in some way, in some level of our existence, even if it's background music. How many times have you found yourself humming a song you didn't know you heard 20 minutes ago? The sound gets in and it shapes us. Sometimes we don't hear the word because the powers that be snatch it away before it has a chance to germinate in any soft place in our soul. And some seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow and the seed sprang up quickly with great vigor but when the sun came out it quickly dried up because it had no root in that shallow soil. This seed is like those who hear the word and receive it with joy, great joy but it doesn't take root in the depths of their identity. And so it slowly withers when times get tough. These seem to be the ones that put all their attention on the emotional expressions of faith. Like the last night at youth camp, when sleep depri deprivation is high and hormone levels are higher, and the camp wants to know how many professions of faith has there been and there's a hard sell on the emotions or zealous revivals where there's no formative follow-up no deepening of the soil or deepening of the soul so that it stays y'all I, I wish it was otherwise but much of christian formation isn't exciting it's mundane. It's habits. It's practices. It's patterns of thought that have been shaped over time like a drip of water on a stone that slowly erodes that stone. 
That is what Christian formation looks like. And when all the focus is on the exuberant fruit and not the deepening of the root, then that faith is usually short-lived, especially when life gets tough. And some seed fell among thorns. Jesus says these are those who have the potential and the capacity to hear the word and accept it. It's there. They have everything they need. The problem with this soil, unlike the other two, is not that it lacks something, but that there's too much there. It's too crowded. It's choked out by other concerns. This soil has no problem with the way of Jesus. It might even welcome the way of Jesus. No problem with Jesus. But it also wants the American way. And the Clegg way. And the Baptist way. And the middle class way. And my way. And in an effort to walk all those ways, we find ourselves pulled in a million different directions not knowing where we're going and barely going anywhere. The many distorts the one. And we can't really hear God's voice because we're trying to hear the cacophony of all the voices. And trying to listen to everything prevents us from actually hearing anything. But some of the seed, some of the seed, fell on good soil producing a crop of 30, 60, 100 fold. In the first century, in those days of primitive farming, no tractors or any utensils like we think about today, implements, in those days, a good harvest was about a tenfold harvest. That was a really great year in those days. A 30 fold harvest would be borderline unthinkable. And a hundredfold harvest would make folks laugh out loud. It just didn't happen. This isn't how the dirt and seeds worked back then. And I wonder how many people fell out of their chairs when Jesus first told this parable. This is a miraculous harvest, an unthinkable harvest, an unimaginable harvest that would have had a farmer's feet dancing. And what is striking to me about this parable is that Jesus tells us what makes the bad soil bad. But He does not tell us what makes the good soil good. He just says, it's good soil. But I think I know what makes the good soil good. I think I know. And this is why I want you to look in your Bibles tonight. Notice the very first word of the parable in verse 3. First words are important. Notice the very first word. Listen, he says. Listen. In Hebrew, that word would be shema. You might have heard that before. Hear, O Israel. Listen. Notice the last phrase of the parable in verse 9. Whoever has ears to hear... Let them hear. Listen. The story of the sower. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Can you hear that? Listen. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This is a parable about listening. What enables it? What stands in the way of it? And I think that's why Jesus says, if you don't get this parable, if you don't take an account of your own listening, if you don't get this, how will you understand any of the parables? This parable is about the things that prevent our hearing Forces that control us from outside of us. That have control of our ears. Forces inside of us that prevent us from having a depth of soul and character. Capacity to hear. Willingness, longing to hear. Or a too crowded life. 
that's too hurried or too noisy or too thorny. And the capacity for those who do hear to produce unthinkable, miraculous, immeasurable good in the world. On this Ash Wednesday and this very first parable, can I ask you to investigate tonight what is preventing you from hearing God anew in your life? What is preventing you from letting the Word of God, the message of God, from getting down into the deepest, soft, fertile places of your life? The thing about parables is that they demand something of us. We don't so much understand a parable as we stand under it. We, we get into it. Parables don't get into us. We get into them and participate in them. They demand openness of us. They demand creativity from us. They demand engagement and wisdom. In short, they demand a listening. Which reminds me of one more thing about this story. The quality of the seed matters very little apart from the quality of the soil. In verse 1 of chapter 4, it says the crowd was so large that Jesus got into a boat and sat down on the boat and taught from the sea. And the crowd stood on the shore or the land is what my translation said. But in the Greek, that's not what it says. In the Greek, it says the crowd stood on the soil. Same word. Even in this sermon, the word is being sown into the soil, and we're left to wonder what kind of soil was there that day. Surely, there was some hard ground there, path-like ground, where the word was gobbled up before it was heard. Surely, there was a Roman soldier that went away laughing that day because what Jesus said flew in the face of Roman propaganda, and he just couldn't hear it because he had another God and had been catechized in other ways. Surely that day by the sea there was some shallow soil where somebody said, hey, this Jesus guy is okay, I, I like this, and then forsook it by the time they made it home. Surely there was some thorny ground. Someone was there that day who had no problem with Jesus and who enjoyed this agricultural lesson. But who had the good life already planned out and couldn't quite figure out how to fit this newness of Jesus in with all the other stuff. And surely, surely, there was some good soil there that day. Where what Jesus said got down deep. And someone with ears heard. And I wonder what kind of soil is in this room tonight on your pew tonight, in your seat tonight. I mean, if a word from God accidentally fell from the heavens into this place tonight, just by chance, what kind of soil would it find? And I ask that, because if God is anything like this crazy farmer, the odds of a word falling are probably pretty good. My life is a listening. My life is a listening. God's is a speaking. My salvation, your salvation, our salvation is in the hearing and the accepting. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Throughout 
Christian history, ashes have been a sign of penitence, humility, confession, and a sign of our own mortality. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Tonight I invite you forward to have ashes imposed upon your forehead, if you so desire, or you can do the back of your hand as well. If bangs are a problem for you, if you could lift those bangs, that would be most helpful. And some of you, that's not a problem. Um, I, didn't, I didn't mention names. Um, come with the spirit of introspection and come taking serious stock of the things that stand in the way of a hearing in your life. All of you are welcome, and none of you are required. Kevin will be at this station. I'll be at this one. Um, won't you come?
Will you take your hymnals? Hymn number 308. And let's stand together as we sing.
And so begins our journey. We have some stories to hear. And we have some stories to tell. And we have some stories to live. So let us go all the way to the cross. And all the way through the cross. And see what God might do. On your way out, please don't forget your seeds. Uh, thanks to Janet and I uh, for making that possible. And I hope that you will plant those wildflowers, sow them somewhere where you can see them, and do so as a way of saying your prayers. Uh, and as you see them, think about what kind of soil you are and we are. Go and love God with all that you are, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Go and love your neighbor as yourself. Do it as if it's the most important thing in all the world. Because it is. And it makes for really, really good soil. Peace be with you as you go. Happy Ash Wednesday.